Welcome back to a closer look with Mark Shine and Mark Miller. And Mark, this is our first full basketball episode. It is. Right? And, and it is December. It got cold outside. So I decided to wear the Medicare recipient uniform, which is a flannel shirt. All right. Well, as soon as I say full basketball, <laughs> we're going to look at football, football because go. we've got a couple of local state champions that we want to pay homage to. You've got Minster in the I first. do. How about the Minster Wildcats? If you look at their season, they win their first three, then they lose four in a row. Now, two of them were close. A one-point loss to Fort Recovery, a one-point loss to Coldwater. But what happens? They win games eight against New Bremen, nine against for sales, 10 against Anna. That's the game you and I did. They had to win. Yeah. They get into the playoffs, a 40-24 win, win over Fort Laramie. We did that game. It wasn't that close. But then they went over Crestview. Crestview had a chance to win the game late, couldn't complete a pass. They beat Delphi St. John's 20 to nothing, roll over Norwalk St. Paul 40 to seven, and then take out Cuyahoga Heights 32 seven. How about the numbers that came out of this? Each team had roughly 59 plays, but Minster had 255 yards on the ground, 141 through the air. They held the Cuyahoga Heights to 130 on the ground, 116 through the air, so a huge advantage that way. How about Hillsman once again? He throws for a touchdown to Aaron Brown. He rushes 31 times. How many times he carried wow. the ball in the state playoffs? Like 75 over the last two games. Yeah. 221 yards, three scores for Jared Hillsman. Isaac Schmiese, you talk about field position, he received five kickoffs, an average of 50 yards per kickoff return for Isaac Schmiesing. Two interceptions, eight tackles. Minster wins their second uh, playoff OHSAA championship in four years. The Fantastic 50 that Drew Hester website I like said they had the toughest schedule in D7. That proves out for them and Minster comes away with a championship. And how about one more thing on a positive note for Minster, Ethan Wolf. Graduated there four years ago. We did him earlier in the season when we talked about some of our where are they now type guys. The 6'6", 258 pound tight end at Tennessee has been invited to play an East-West Shrine Bowl game. That's January 20th in St. Petersburg. Ethan Wolf ended up second in the Tennessee reception list with 91, that's for a tight end, 998 total yards and seven TDs in his career there. Why, Mark Miller, do you get invited to the Shrine game? Because you want to be noticed by guys who play on Sunday. And so good luck to Ethan Wolf. Congratulations to the Minster Wildcats and good luck to Ethan Wolf in that bowl game. That's right, Minster got MAC State Championship number 124. Now I'm gonna tell you about 125 because Marion Local finished 15 and 0. They ran the table and they MAC. They ran the table all the way through the playoffs. Division six state champs. This is their 10th state championship. Cleveland St. Ignatius holds the record with 11. Heads up, that record's gonna fall. This is their sixth in the last seven years. They beat Kirtland in the championship to do it, 34 to 11. And Kirtland is a great program. They've been in the championship game six out of the last seven years. Three times they were champs, so they didn't beat any slouch in that state championship. They did it with a run pass, pass balance. Nathan Bruns, 10 out of 15, 178 yards and two touchdowns through the air. And running backs, they've got that stable and they used them all. Jack Beaning, Alex Partington, Nolan Habadad. They have they combined for 123 yards and three touchdowns. And the defense, that's where they live down there in Marion Local. That defense, they were awesome as they were all year long. How many shutouts did they have? I know they had the first three games in the playoffs. We're all shutouts. Congratulations to Tim Goodwin, all the good folks down at Marion Local. Yet another state championship for the Flyers. 125, 125 for the, for the conference. How about that? And how That's about awesome. Coach Goodwin? He traded in donuts for shutouts for Mrs. Yoder's chicken. Mrs. Yoder's can't, chicken. Can't beat that, can What a reward right. better than a state trophy. That's a good trip. Well, that's a good trip. Yeah, that's all right. All well, let's right. look at one other championship oh. to basketball this time. Let's look at a tip-off classic that was played at the Light. I had the privilege of being out there for both nights. On Friday night in game one, Lima Central Catholic came from 21 down to beat Bath 65-56. Mark Janowski for LCC and Chad Fry for Bath each had 21. But the spark plug for LCC that night, bench play from DeMontre Gardner. He had 15 in quarters, two, three, and four. And Ronnie Banks, who brought a lot of energy to the game, he had nine in quarters, three, and four. That took us to the second game of the night where Elida just kind of pulled away from Shawnee, 58-45, and just kind of one of those methodical type games. Daniel Unruh had 19 for Elida. And then Johnny Capella and Riley Rosado had 11 each 
for Shawnee that night. The consolation game, it was all Shawnee. In the middle two quarters, they outscored the Bath Wildcats 48 to nine in quarters two and three, going on to a 61-35 win. Caprella had 17 and Fry had 14. The championship game, once again, kind of a methodically but well-played game. Eli to 54-42 for Lima Central Catholic. Unruh had 18. The middle two quarters went to, to Eli to 27 to 12, and therein lies the margin for them. The uh, all-tournament team, this was the, first of all, the, the 10th Elida Championship. LCC has won 11. Denny Thompson's won his third now. The all-tournament team, Chad Fry from Bath, Johnny Caprella from Shawnee, Mark Janowski from LCC, and Daniel Unruh and Isaac McAdams from Elida. Another good tournament. Great job putting that together. Dave Evans and your crew, a great place to be on Friday and Saturday night last week. 29th straight tip-off. 29th straight one. I think one. we've been there for every yes, one of we them. we have. All right, let's continue on with basketball. Stat stuffers. Mark, you're going to start it off with a pretty good player. Here's a pretty good guy. His name is Justin <laughs> Arns, and he plays for Versailles. Well, he hung 46 on the board against Salina. He had 10 threes. He also 10 threes. 10 threes in a the game. <laughs> There's 30 of his points. Right? He had nine rebounds, and Versailles Got their season off to a start with a 64-42 win. He outscored Salina 46-42, did Justin Arns, and they defeated Salina 64-42. Peyton Judy from Fort Recovery. Ten points and two threes as they beat St. Mary's 55-45. Then he comes back with 37 points and five threes as they beat Greenville 79-72 in overtime. So they needed every one of those every points one. to That's get right. Greenville. That's right. That's what you want to see. Get, get them when we need them. That, yeah. That's important. Tyler Slarman from St. Henry. Uh, in a game against Spencerville, which uh, St. Henry won 55-25, he had 16 points and 11 boards. Against Rushi, which was a 55-46 win for St. Henry, 22 points and 7 rebounds in that game. Good start for St. Henry and Tyler Schlarman. Brody Bowman from Temple, 21 points on Friday night in a loss to Ottoville, 25 points and a win over Continental on Saturday. We're used to Brody doing it with a three. He can still shoot the three, but he's scoring in a lot of other ways now. That's a pretty good weekend, 46 points in a and a one-on-one -on -one record coming out of the opening Yeah, and, and who else who shot the three balls for a Temple Christian this weekend? Noel Howe, he had 20 points on Friday in the loss. Six of those from the three point, six baskets from the three-point line. He also had 20 points on Saturday night in the win, and three of those were from the three-point line, and those 20 points he had right there. Well, with the lack of size, they've got to have uh, to shoot, got to shoot the three all That's right. Let's look at Logan Kemper from Ottoville. That game right there, he had 25 points in that game against Temple. Came back with another win over Corey Rosson on Saturday. He had 16, so a good scoring weekend for Logan. And people are talking about Kenton and how Coach Matt McCullough is starting to put things together over there year after year after year. Well, they had Landon Rush come through for him this weekend. He had 20 points in a seven-point win over Indian Lake. 23 and a blowout win over Waynesfield. Watch out for Kenton. That's kind of a surprise team in the Western Buckeye League this year. All right. Well, now we're going to do rule of the week, and you have picked right. backboards, so school us on backboards. Well, we had some questions about backboards. I thought we'd just kind of put it all together into one little segment. First of all, there are three types of backboards that are legal. Most of us probably grew up playing on that one that's six feet wide and four feet high. We started going a few years ago because of all the great jumpers around to the rectangular board that's six feet wide and three and a half feet high. Suppose that lack of six inches right there makes it less of an opportunity to whack your head when you go drive into the basket. And uh, that's the recommendation now for all new boards and replacement boards. And remember, did you play on the old fan-shaped board? Oh, they were on the, the side. That's side right, on the basket side baskets too. typically, but some people had them on the main court. They are still legal, the fan-shaped boards are. They have to be transparent. In other words, they can't be tinted if they're a glass board. Solid boards, which of course are usually are made out of wood, have to be white. There is a square that's 24 inches wide. Of course, the basket sets in the middle of that and 18 inches high. Those squares have to be either orange or black on a painted board. So where do we put it at? Well, what a lot of people don't know is it's in the middle of the baseline. Of course, you wouldn't want one off in the corner somewhere, but it is four feet extended from the baseline. If you think of the free throw line being 15 feet from the basket, there's an additional four feet from the basket to the baseline uh, at that particular area. And um, it has to be upper edges are 13 feet above the floor. You know that story about guys who can jump up and take a dime off the top of the backboard? Mm -hmm. They got to get 13 feet up in the air to do that. That's probably That's not going to happen. Yeah. And at least three feet away from any spectators. Remember the days when we used to hang backboards off of running tracks and things mm -hmm. like that? Mm -hmm. Well, you had to be at least three foot away from the spectators. Here's a rule a lot of people don't understand. It has to have padding on all, four, all three sides, up 15 inches uh, on the end, and of course padded across the bottom. But all four edges of the backboard are in play. You hear people yell, hey, that ball's mm -hmm. out of bounds. It's on top of the board. The top of the backboard is in play. It cannot hit a support. 
but the top of the backboard is in play. The ball cannot be shot or passed from the inside of the basket um, over top. If it goes over top of the backboard, hits the rim and goes over top, or a pass goes from the forecourt over the backboard, it's out of play. But you can shoot it or pass it from behind the backboard over it towards the forecourt. A la Larry Bird. Larry Bird, there you go. Okay, so that's legal. Uh, we talked about can you slap the backboard. Unintentionally slapping the backboard is not a technical foul. The key is unintentionally. If you slap it intentionally, that is a technical foul. You're going to try to block a shot, your hand hits the backboard, that's legal. Now, you might vibrate the backboard with the ball inside the plane. If you do that, that's goaltending, but it's not a technical foul. And uh, we do have one more thing I want to stick in there, the Wilt rule. Remember Wilt Chamberlain? Oh, when he played for Kansas, Wilt would stand right in front of the basket. They would take the ball out of bounds and lob it over the fan-shaped backboard for him to catch and dunk. It is illegal to lob a basketball over a fan-shaped board from out of bounds. Uh -huh. Just the Wilt rule. I have one backboard complaint. All right. You know the pad that goes across the bottom? Yeah. It sticks out about an inch. Yeah. How many times playing and, and broadcasting have yeah. we seen a ball come down, a kid's just ready to grab yeah. it, it caroms off that pad and bounces. I'd That's like right. for them to kind of inset that, just so it's almost a, flush. It's a little bit of really a, hard yeah. to do. It, it's a safety issue. I had a, a guy I played with in college who could just flat out jump. So naturally they come out and they clean the glass backboard before every game. He would come out and put perspiration <laughs> or and go up and hit. Wham on the backboard and There's say, that's me. <laughs> kind of an intimidation right. thing. Good job with backboard. Right, there we go. All right, we've got a bright spot. We got three of them this yeah. week. And Coach Shine found a fellowship of Christian athletes uh, thing called the Competitor's Creed, the Athlete's Creed. Let's, let's talk about that. Well, let's me. put it up on the screen if we can. I'm not going to take time to go through and read the entire thing, but you can kind of look through it as we scroll down. This came about from a question I got. Hey, can athletes be Christians and still compete? Is there anything wrong with being an athlete who, you know, you want to go out and you compete and you do your very best, or should you be kind of a meek and mild guy and, and lay back a little bit? Of course, my response to that is, I think Jesus Christ might have been the best competitor <laughs> of all, and I think he took yeah. a lot and competed in a lot of different ways. But if you look through this, it talks about your strength, where it comes from, it talks about your attitude on and off the field, and it's our goal. I know, Mark, you and I have been a part of FCA for a long, long time, and, and the things it does, it's our goal that an athlete will have something special about him personally or her personally, and the other people go, hey, what is it you got that makes you different? And with that particular thing, you go, well, I know what it is. That person's got Jesus Christ in their heart. And particularly as we're in this Christmas time season, we ought to keep that in memory and keep that in mind. But a lot of things in there that are pretty good, and I've got copies of that. If you, you know, email me or something, I'll make sure you get a copy. That's very good. I think yeah. we can all think of athletes that were Christian competitors. Right. Reggie White comes to my mind. I don't know of a better competitor than him, but yet a, a mild Christian man off the, off the I, I, I heard an FCA guy, remember the old uh, athletes in action, uh, the first shot of a one-on-one, -on -one, he gets whacked in the throat. Okay, goes back in the second one. He checks out the guy he's supposed to check out and checked him out all the way to midcourt. And the guy said, hey, what are you doing? I thought you were a Christian. I am, but I'm an athlete and a competitor too. Yep, there so you go. So you can do that. Hey, for the second bright spot, we want to talk about Paul Benson, Tom Benson. <laughs> I don't know who Paul is. Tom Benson Hall of Fame Stadium. That's where the state championship football games were played this last weekend. They moved back to Canton from Columbus, and the attendance Mark Shine found Great. out was yep. the fourth highest fourth of all highest. time. Yep. That's pretty good, 61,000 and yep. something. Correct. Well, you know, it was great weather yep. all weekend. That right. surely helped. It's a new stadium. A lot of people wanted to maybe go see the new stadium. It's right beside the Hall of Fame, the Pro Football Hall of Fame. That's a draw. They're building the Hall of Fame Village. It's going to continue to get more and more outlandish around there. But you know, one of the words, the things that we've talked about are a lot of people say we want it in Columbus for a lot of reasons. Right. There are a lot of reasons sure. to have it there. But one of the main ones is that people didn't want to travel from Southern Ohio all the way to Canton. They thought Columbus was more centrally located. We did a little bit of a study on the attendance of the seven different divisions and you really can't draw any conclusion. The teams that uh, traveled from down south in Southern Ohio, they were the three highest attended games. Mm -hmm. We thought maybe those morning games would would be a problem. Minster and Marion Local, they drew pretty well right. in the morning. Uh, a Thursday night game drew pretty well. Divisions, top to bottom, it really doesn't make any sense. All we know is this was a great year for high school football. They attended, they came to the games, and we had some great games in Canton. Yeah, great, and it's a good place to put it. Let's do one more thing, Mark. Yeah. We, we were uh, telecasting, of course, from the Elida Field House this week, and uh, our replay sponsor was A&W Root Beer over in Delphus. And so Saturday night, after you know, we and I kind of talked about being hungry, maybe you have to make a little trip after the game um, to go get some A&W. 
Well, Don Unruh and the crew brought us mugs, root beer by the gallon, and cheeseburgers delivered for the crowd. You want to make the WSN guys happy? Man. Bring them food. Food. Feed yeah, them. There you go. Yeah, thanks to the Unruhs and yeah. the Big Lows for, for taking care of us. That, that was really, really nice. Right. All right, we're going to take a break. Come back with Mark Shine doing Plays of the Week. You're watching high school basketball on Closer Look with Mark and Mark. All right, welcome back. We are now at the big screen, and Mark Shine's going to do plays of the week. What do you got? Well, first of all, Denny Thompson is one of my favorite coaches. There's Denny back here because he's got a great job of offensive execution. His defense is pretty good, too. But his ability to put set plays together, this is going to be a baseline out-of-bounds play. Let's run it through once, then we'll go and kind of look back and see how everybody comes out. It's going to be a nice basket. This is Skyler Smith taking the ball out-of-bounds here. And here comes the inbound pass. They roll Isaac McAdams around, and he gets a basket out of it. Now, if we have a chance to go back and look through this again and set everybody up, here's Unruh's screen right here. Now, you got to guard Unruh. He can score. He leads him in scoring right here. But Adams, instead of going to the corner, rolls in this direction, comes back to the lane. The pass is on time. The catch. we got these two guys out here keeping defenders busy so they can't step in here and help. Looks where Biggs Johnson is. He's expecting something on this side of the floor. That's where most out-of-bounds play go. And here comes Isaac McAdams. He rolls to the basket right here as we run the play. And it's an easy basket inside, a catch, and a score without the defense having much chance to get it. And Isaac's smart to fall down. Yeah, and maybe a different play with Janowski in there on defense, but he wasn't. Here's your he second play. All right. Coaches always talk about purposeful movement and can you make the ball go from side to side and some coaches talk about, can you throw four to six passes per possession? And then also the fact that jump shot, mid-range jump shot's dead. So watch the ball right here. It goes from this side of the floor over here where Banks had it. Here's Johnson. It's going to go all the way around to the opposite side of the court. So here's a pass, here's a pass, here's a pass. That's three. You take the post player across and make the defense move. Johnson's going to slide down here, and he'll eventually get the ball where he can make a nice one-on-one -on -one move to the goal. Pull up jump shot from about 15 feet. This is really well done. You talk to kids about being a basketball player. Don't be a robot. Watch the play as it develops. We've already had one pass. There's two. There's three. Here comes two screens down. Here comes Banks back up. The cross court skip pass here. And now watch the nice one dribble move to the goal. So you've taken the ball with four passes. You've gone from right side to left side and back across the floor again. And then you get a nice one-on-one -on -one move. We talk people can't do the pull-up jump shot right there. There's a 15-footer off the drill. That's a great move. Skip pass. My Skip coach pass. called it cross-court pass, and we got benched for that. Isn't now that it's something? part of the offense. It is it? absolutely part of the offense. If you, you could see why as you went through the play a little bit. They've taken away that pass. It was at the top of the circle. The defense was back inside helping so much. Here it comes up again. Watch how much the defense helps back in the post area right here. Here's our two screens down. And here's a deny here. Here's backside help and get that skip pass across. There it is. And you're right, it used to be, don't ever throw that thing. And now it's a part of the offense. How much offense do teams have in now at this time of the year? Well, it depends. If you've got a veteran crew back and you've been doing the same things offensively year after year after year, you might have a lot in, although you're still going to put special things in for special guys on your team. If you've got a young basketball team, you mentioned Perry a little while ago, yeah. you've got a young team, you probably don't have much in at all right now. You're still teaching fundamentals and the basic idea on how to play. All right, Mark Shine, good job. There we go. Fun. Fun going over the plays it on the is. big this screen. Cool, man. All right, we'll go back over to the desk and do our third segment. We'll be right back after this. We are back with our final segment, and that starts off with the College Player of the Week, a new sec segment for this year. You know, in football, we kind of did where they are, where are they now? Well, now we're going to do a College Player of the Week, and this yep. week it is? Well, this week we're going to choose Ryan Bruns from Ohio Northern University. Of course, he's a Marion local graduate in 2015. His team went to the regional finals in 2015, where they lost to Tri-Village. He was a first-team All-Mac player his senior year, first or second-team All-Mac his junior year. He's now at Ohio Northern in his junior year. He's listed at 6'8", 225 pounds. He started 36 of 49 games in his first two seasons. He was a second-team All-OAC player a year ago, averaged seven and a half rebounds. He came into this season after two years at Northern with 561 total points, 286 rebounds, 
and he is fifth all-time coming into this season with 124 black shots for the Polar Bears. Now this season, the Polar Bears are currently 3-3. Three three. They play Wilmington at home on Wednesday night before going to uh, Mount Union on Saturday. They have Mount Union at home on Saturday. He currently, Ryan Bruns, is averaging 19.8 points per game. He's shooting 56% from the field. Big guys can't shoot free throws? Nope, he's shooting 82.4% wow. from the free throw line. 7.6 rebounds, and he averages three block shots a game. The Polar Bears are fun to watch. They're a good, good team to see on Friday nights and Saturday afternoons. Go catch the Polar Bears over there this year. All right, Ryan Brun's a good player. Now we're oh, going yeah. to look ahead at some of the games we got coming up this week. As always, we got great ones as the season gets started. We're going to go by league to start off with, and Mark's got a big game out of the PCL. Yeah, a lot of leagues don't start for another week yet. Some of them start after Christmas. The PCL gets it going this week. It's Columbus Grove at Ottoville this week. Columbus Grove lost to Wayne Trace 55 to 64 on Friday night. But how about this win? They go to Jackson Center on Saturday night and win 65 41 over Jackson Center. That's always a good team to play down yeah. there and win down there. That's something special. Chris Souter's team, he's in his second year as Chris. They had six different players make a three point field goal against Jackson Center. They got guys you can shoot both nights. Um, they play at Bath on Saturday night. Ottoville. Keith Utendorf has moved over from Fort Jennings to Ottaville. They've started out 2-0 for Keith. They have that 75-52 win over Temple Christian we talked about a moment ago, and they defeated Corey Ross in 78-45. Lots of guys scoring points for him. Bendeley, uh, Turban, Mormon, Kemper. Martin had some threes the other night. They made, uh, what, nine three-point field goals against uh, uh, Corey Ross the other night. This is a team that can flat out play. It might well turn into a shootout. Uh, we talked about Columbus Grove is at Bath on Saturday night, and Ottoville has Ada at home on Saturday also. Let's go to the NWCC, and the game we want to look at is Temple. They stand at 1-1. One one. They're going to go play at Perry. That's 0-1. Temple on Friday lost to Ottoville, as we've talked about. Bowman and Noah Howell scored lots of points. But how about Ethan DeLeon had 14 rebounds. Then on Saturday, good win against Continental. And Bowman and Howell again started piling up those threes. Howell has nine threes on the season so far. Perry, they lost to Delphus uh, St. John's 42 to 34. They only shot 31% from the field. Jamal Whiteside had 11 points, but there are only two guys running out there for Matt Tabler, the head coach, with any varsity experience at all. So there is much improvement ahead for this Perry team. As we know, Coach will get them ready to go. Yeah, I think a lot of teams right now, you're not going to know how good they are until you get some time around you know, Christmas time or maybe even end of the first right. part of the year. Teams, yeah. especially like Perry, who have so many new young players for them. Well, let's look at the BBC also. And let's look at the premier game perhaps in that conference this week as they get rolling, and that's Lipsick at Arlington. Lipsick comes in at 1-1 one one for Chris Kuhlman. Uh, they lost uh, at Bluffton 41-37. Tyler Gillespie had 12, a couple threes. Reese Mangus had 11. But they came back on Saturday night to defeat Holgate. And even though it's not Paul Wayne there anymore, Holgate likes to slow it down. They beat, defeated Holgate 44-39. And once again, Mangus led them in scoring with 11 this time. Holgate led 31-28 going into the fourth quarter. So big fourth quarter for Lipsick, And they win 44-39 at Holgate. Arlington, Jason Vermillion, he's in his 20th year already. You know, it, it just shoots by. He's 20, uh, 295 wins, 138 losses in 20 years for Jason Vermillion. They started out 1-0. They defeated Fort Jennings 53-38. Some guy named Jarrett Vermillion. Hmm. Sophomore, 16 <laughs> points, a couple of threes. Caleb Price had 13. Ivan Berry had 10. Uh, they, they shoot the basketball very well and very fundamentally sound. This will be a good early season test for both teams in the BBC. Well, let's go to the MAC. You know, they got to flip it over from football to basketball yep. a lot in the MAC. Delphus St. John's 2-0 at Versailles 1-0. Delphus St. John's only had eight practices before their opening game due to that football run that they had. They beat Fremont St. Joe on Friday night 65-33. Saturday came back and beat Perry 42-34. They only shot 38% and had 16 turnovers, but they had even scoring. Nobody stood out there and had most of the points, so that's a team that's a work in progress yep. as well. They play Versailles, the odds-on favorite to be one of the best teams in our area. They beat Salina 64-42, as Mark told you earlier, with Arns having 46 points. Of course, St. John's came off of that state semifinal last year. This is a big game very, very early in the season. Is Delphi St. John's ready? Because Arns is. Well, this, of course, this, why are they playing a week early? We kind of have to review this a little bit every year. 
for sales plays in the Southwest District, which means their tournament starts a week ahead of everybody else. So they take their last MAC game and move it to the first one and play it before everybody else starts. The rest of the MAC will start next week. How about a challenge, though, for St. John's? Now they've got to go against yeah. Orange. They've got to do it at Versailles. Great facility, but a difficult place to go yes, and play. Yes. There yeah. it is. Okay, well, let's look at Lyman Senior. The track gets started this week. Of course, they play 14 track games this year because they play home and home away against everybody. Lyman Senior, 1-0, defeated Anthony Wayne in overtime, 64-63. B.J. Miller with 19, including a three-point field goal. Khalil King had 15 and a three-point field goal. Seven different Spartans put points on the board. You know how Coach Simpson likes to get a lot of guys in and out of the game. Mm -hmm. And then they go to Middletown. That's a big rival game. Can't look ahead. Uh, against Clay and look ahead to Middletown, even though that's always a big rival game. That's at Middletown on Saturday night and the new facility they have down yeah, there at Middletown. The gym, yeah, yeah. open up a new gym down there. That'll be a big challenge too. Don't sleep on Oregon Clay. Dave Rodriguez in his first year, their last winning season was 2004-2005. They have a junior returning starter in Jesse Warmer. He is about 5'10", a senior, Dustin Ayton. He's about six foot. They have already got a win over Tiffin Columbian. I just like to win your first game. That's always a good thing to do yes, when you're is. a new coach. Yep. Um, they defeated Tiffin Columbian 56 38. Uh, Trey Reddick had 11, Warner had 10. Um, they held Tiffin Columbian to 20 points through the first three quarters, solid defensively. One other thing I want to mention about the track Ed Heinschel is starting his 39th year yep. at Toledo St. John's. They're the favorite again in the track um, this year. He's got 692 wins. He's 68 years old in his 39th year. He just keeps rolling along in St. John's. Got a great program there. And yeah. obviously, if you looked at the vote by the media, they were the favorites in the track this year. Well, he'll get 700 wins, but he's still a long way behind uh, Mr. Quartercrest. Mr. Quartercrest, yeah. And that's, a, that's a record. That'll never break that. No, I don't think so. Hey, let's look at a non-league matchup because it's going to be a good one. St. Henry, 2-0 out of the MAC at Shawnee from the WBL, 1-1 one one after that tip-off weekend that Mark just talked about a little while ago. St. Henry beat Spencerville 55-25. Tyler Schlarman, 16 points, 11 rebounds. And then they beat Rushi 56-46. Schlarman again scored 22-7. Parker Link chipped in with 11 points. Shawnee, as Mark talked about earlier, lost to Elida in the tip-off 58-45. And then they beat Bath 61-35. But Johnny Caprella put together two pretty good nights, scoring and rebounding. 11-7 on Friday, 17-12 on Saturday, and how about Tyler Moore? Tyler's the guy that hurt his shoulder mm -hmm. last year and missed most of the season. We saw him, he's got a, bit, a wrap on it, but he played pretty well, didn't seem to be yeah. favoring it at all. So hopefully he's healthy now and will remain so. He had 10 points on Friday, another 11 on Saturday. They had two, talking about Shawnee now, on Saturday night, they had two 21 to zero right. runs within their game. So that is obvious that they are Correct. explosive on offense. I, we talked that we really yeah. liked how aggressive they That's were right. going to the basket. Well, two things. Number one, they made some threes Saturday night, too, which they did not do Friday night. If you can shoot threes and then take the ball to the basket as well as they do, that's a, blend, a positive for them. And because I know you liked my classic rock reference the other night, oh, yeah. I'm driving out here and I hear there's going to be a jailbreak oh. on, on my radio, and that's what Shawnee plays like. When they can get up and down the floor and make it a jailbreak game, get to the basket, score in transition, that just benefits them to no end. It'll be a real challenge for a good St. Henry team to slow that thing down, take the ball inside, draw contact, whatever it takes to be to slow the game down, and don't let Shawnee get into one of those free throw games. I get to do that game. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it'll be good. I'm still trying to, to catch up on your uh, pregame notes there, the keys to oh. the game with the Shakespeare, Shakespeare? and the, the towel yeah. guy. Okay, well. All right. <laughs> hey, let's look at the other games that we've got coming up on our broadcast schedule this week. There you see it. Boy, they're coming fast and furious. We'll get through the holidays and then, as Mark mentioned, into most of the league play starting in January. Check our schedule. Follow the games. We've got a lot of good ones from all over the place for us. Mark will be doing some of those games. Going to be off trying to watch some football games. All right. Hey, we thank you for joining. A closer look again this week. Come back again next week. We'll continue to talk basketball on WOSN.